Good day. I'm Dan Assard and welcome to our Insights with Foresights webinar series. We hope today's webinar is going to be the doggone best webinar you have ever attended. We're not trying to be catty and barking that post, but we know that we're pretty, pretty good at this. And we hope that you're gonna believe after you spend this time that this is the best bona fide opportunity for expanding your market share and learning about the way the pet business can add dramatically to the quality of your existing business. We're going to present an insightful look at how and why the family, human family funeral business should be considering adding a new dynamic, the pet service business for the pet family of each of your neighbors. Allow me to introduce you to our panelists. This presentation is gonna be presented by Chris Kruger and John McQueen. Chris, if you don't know, is the Chief Operating Officer of the Foresight Companies. He is a partner. And Chris has spent more than 20 years of his life in this business as a leader, both at SCI and a consultant to privately owned funeral homes, working in the US, North America, and frankly, the world. John McQueen is the Director of Client Experience at Foresight. John is a lifetime funeral director and the former owner of the multi-branded Anderson McQueen A Life Tribute businesses, as well as a very large regional trade business and a co company that serviced county contracts. In addition to John's very well-recognized pet service business serving the St. Pete and Tampa area. The agenda that we're going to be dealing with today is pretty simple. We want to explain to you why should a funeral home offer pet cremations? What the effects to your business will be of this adjunct because it's going to supplement the lost revenue and lost profit from the effects of cremation. We want you to understand how this affects the competitive landscape and how this will help you by increasing your value. We want you to understand the economics of the pet loss business and we're going to be prepared to answer your questions as we go along. And no question is irrelevant. The broad overview of our webinar protocols are pretty simple. You have all been muted. If you have a question, you can write it into the Zoom question box on the bottom of your page. <clears throat> we'll answer these questions either as we go along or save them for the end of the presentation. Uh, we do have time dedicated at the end of the session for these questions. So you can see on your screen right now what this screensaver looks like when you raise your hand or have a question. We'll be able to see them and I'll be tracking them. And at the end of the prepared comments of Chris and John, then we'll answer as many of these questions as we can. If we can't get to all the questions, I promise you we will answer these questions for you individually. Or if one of your questions is a little bit more customized, then we'll take that one-on-one -on -one with you after the webinar is over. So don't be a scaredy cat. Uh, this seminar is being recorded. We will be sending you a link to the recording at the end. We are also gonna be sending you a copy of all the slides that you see as a handout. Uh, but don't be scared and don't pause asking any questions during the seminar. Uh, please don't go for a drink. Uh, Chris and John do have something there because we don't want them to get hoarse. <laughs> uh, and yes, we do have a bet as to which one of us will get more stupid puns about animals in during this time period. 
So uh, what I want you to understand is why we're using our webinar time on the pet business. There are 85 million families in the United States that own a pet. That's almost 60% of all households. 65% of all pet owners are either Gen X or older. 63 million own at least one dog in their lifetime. The average lifetime of a dog or cat is seven years or less, which means that the average person owns multiple pets and therefore deals with multiple pet family deaths. And I say the phrase pet family, because any of you that have had animals, you understand the grieving and emotion when a pet dies is just as strong as anyone would experience anywhere else. There's almost one and a half million pet cremations last year alone. And there are about a thousand pet crematories, but most of these are silent. They're shadowy. They are not known to the public. So why should you take the time and effort to invest and modify your business to become a funeral provider for the pet sector? Well, there's a lot of changes that are taking place. Revenue per call has pretty much reached an apex, increasing slightly by uh, inflation. You need new tools and techniques that are going to be proven to generate revenue and profit. You have a fixed overhead. So anytime we can bring more revenue in, that's going to benefit your bottom line. So today we want to focus on three reasons to serve pet owners. First of all, John and Chris are going to talk about the impact of cremation on the funeral business, and this is going to be an adjunct to your bottom line. There's new competition within the market, and you want to be able to differentiate yourself. And as John has learned through his many years, and he's going to share with you today, all the experiences, this is a unique selling proposition for your market, for human funeral services to consumers. So with that, we want to be very, very effective. Ladies and gentlemen, what I'd like to do at this time is turn the presentation over to Chris Kruger, my partner and our chief operating officer. Chris. Thanks, Dan. Um, first of all, I apologize to all of you out there. I, I see that Dan has only chased off about five or six of you with his uh, with his uh, jokes and, and, and other uh, commentary. But in all seriousness, you know, one of the storylines in these crazy times of COVID that I thoroughly enjoyed when I turned on the news was the empty uh, shelters and, uh, you know, what was called the puppy boom. I don't, I think it's pretty hard to uh, dispute given the, the statistic that Dan just ran through that uh, pets have become an even more significant part of our lives through these crazy times. Um, and uh, as, as pointed out in those statistics, uh, they're like an extension of our family. Um, one of the things, you know, you hear over and over, I hear from, I should say, from funeral directors, um, is the question, why should we get into the, the pet business? I've, I've heard that it could be disrespectful, people object to it. Uh, but one of the reasons, I think Dan has touched on it, but I want to throw it back to you, John. Um, if we can go back one slide, Dan, what are, John, why would, uh, why should a funeral director get into the, to, into the pet business? Well, again, um, Chris, thank you. The, uh, it's important that funeral directors consider getting into the pet business for, again, these three different reasons here primarily. Um, but again, as, uh, as the cremation market continues to rise and we see diminishing profits, um, again, this gives you uh, another ancillary avenue of revenue 
Um, also, you know, where we have a bunch of new competitors within our marketplace uh, beyond just that funeral home down the street. And so, uh, again, we're going to want to uh, talk a little bit about that. And then finally, again, uh, we live in a world today where, uh, you know, the consumer's attention is drawn in a multitude of different directions um, by uh, all sorts of media and advertising and uh, other uh, forms of communication out there that uh, actually um, sort of get us lost in that sea of sameness. And so uh, we want to make sure we have a unique selling proposition, something that makes us stand out from that other funeral home down the street um, so that the consumer considers you over your colleague that's working down the street from you. Excellent. Um, so when you talk about the impact of cremation. So if you would, uh, what, what are the effects of cremation uh, on the business? Sure. Um, well, here, this slide here shows that, you know, obviously the continuing uh, rise of cremation uh, from 1975 until, uh, well, actually till today, but also projected on out till 2035. So as you can see on the slide, nearly a thousand percent increase in cremation has occurred since 1975. And it's continued, you know, it's, it's estimated to continue to rise even more and more. And we all know that cremation has now nationally overtaken burial as a standard form of disposition. Um, so again, by 2035, it is projected to climb another 54% over the next 15 years. So again, just really increasing more and more. So if you're currently in a state that doesn't have a lot of cremation, hey, God love you, but uh, it is coming your way too. So it's best to be ahead of the curve and this will give you an opportunity to do that. Also, you can see that, as we mentioned, we talked about the financial strength uh, for funeral homes is actually decreasing dramatically. And that's because, again, cremation is having a huge impact on the bottom line for funeral homes. So we have to find ways to adapt, ways to make up those shortfalls if we want to stay financially sound um, going into the future. And then also, uh, you know, one of the biggest things here that, that is detrimental for funeral service is that as cremation continues to rise, even if we're embracing cremation, that as that continues to rise, the presence of the decedent now becomes optional. And uh, it's sort of like an old funeral director once told me one time, it's like going to a um, uh, having a wedding without the bride. And so, you know, the same goes for a funeral. And so when the decedent becomes optional, the problem is it actually opens up the marketplace to others beyond us that are actually in funeral service. Uh, because again, sort of as the funeral home, when we controlled the body, we controlled the service, but without the body, anyone can do the service. And so those are some of the main reasons um, as to how the cremation is affecting our bottom lines. Great, yeah, uh, John, we talked a lot about this last week at the Kate Boylston Cremation Strategies Conference, but what are the, um, what are the, what are the, what's the financial impact on the strength of business uh, from these other uh, things that are affecting business today? Sure. Well, I point out three here for you to really consider. If you think about it as uh, um, cremation increases, some of the areas where we lose revenue, many of the places where we used to be able to add on the revenue and, and enjoy some of the benefits that went along with that are diminishing. So for example, embalming, um, embalming is becoming less and less, you know, uh, uh, in my marketplace, probably 25 to 30% of those that, that we care for are actually embalmed anymore nowadays. So we lose the revenue from that. Um, and many times we charge less for refrigeration or alternate care. So again, you're losing revenue there. Also the use of automotive equipment, especially those hearses that we have out there. Um, since again, the services are becoming with bodies present are becoming less and less, uh, you know, the use of certain automotive equipment is becoming less. And along those lines, 
oftentimes even services are becoming less. So we're losing the revenues from those two areas. And then finally, another area is when it comes to merchandise. Yes, we may still be selling merchandise, um, but oftentimes what happens is instead of selling the large box, we're selling the small box. And in doing so, you know, again, that diminishes our profit margins um, tremendously and the financial strength of the company overall. And those are just a few of the broad areas where it can affect us from a financial standpoint. Obviously, uh, one of the things that we do at Foresight that's great is we help those companies not only identify those, but other areas too that we may need to target to strengthen the financial aspects of the business. So, Excellent. <clears throat> Um, also, though, let's throw in that global pandemic. We all love to talk about the global pandemic, right? Uh, who would have thought that when we started this and it was only going to be a few weeks that we'd still be sitting here nine or 10 months later still talking about it? But, uh, you know, we throw a global pandemic into the mix. And what does that do? Well, hey, according to an October 12th uh, Wall Street Journal article, uh, yes, the number of services had increased uh, by 7.3%. This article um, actually interviewed Service Corporation International and uh, they had shared that their, their services being performed were up 7.3%, which is great, but they had seen no increase in revenue. So we're working harder, but we're not necessarily making any more money at that. Um, so that again is impacting the bottom line for many of our funeral homes out there. So tell us a little bit about uh, what is the competitive landscape that, that funeral directors are facing today? Sure. Uh, well, again, uh, as I shared earlier, you know, the competitive landscape is changing because once you remove the guest of honor um, from the actual service itself, you know, that opens up doors. So, um, you know, there is a lot of new competition that's out there that's looking to steal your business um, and win that race to the finish line for who's going to actually get that family to um, allow them to provide the services. And what we want to ensure is to make sure that funeral homes are not becoming simply body disposers, but are actually still intimately involved in the services. And so when we think about who our real competition is, oftentimes we think of the low cost providers. We think of, you know, that funeral home down the street that has opened that is offering that low cost cremation and they're undercutting us. And true, that is competition for many of us, uh, but yet those are not the only ones you should be worried about you actually need to think about some of the other ones. Say, for example, the high-end resorts like the Ritz-Carlton or the Marriott Hotels, um, Hilton, all those different resorts that are now uh, oftentimes advertising that they can provide memorial services um, and end-of-life celebrations and things like that to their guests. And so what that's really done for our funeral homes is that in the funeral industry, we now need to compete with, in, you know, with other companies like this, that uh, we need to make sure our facilities are up to par so that we're able to um, effectively serve our customer. Same with restaurants and private clubs. Again, uh, here in my area, oftentimes we have a lot of families that choose to have their services at the Yacht Club or some of the other big resorts here in the area. Um, so again, we're competing against restaurants, clubs, high-end resorts. Also specialty venues, being down here on the Gulf Coast, um, a lot of families want to have that, not only that wedding on the beach, but they're now wanting to have that memorial service on the beach. And unfortunately, you know, if you can find a guy with a van and a stack of chairs, you're pretty well set to uh, be able to perform a memorial service out on the beach. Um, so we need to find ways that we keep the funeral directors involved in doing these types of services. So that creativity side, um, that willingness to do something a little different and step outside of our box um, in order to compete against them. And I hate to say it, uh, maybe not in some of your all's markets, but definitely in my market, 
end of life care providers are actually even becoming our competition, uh, whether that be hospice or other uh, long term type care facilities. We have a lot here in the area that even tell families, you know, hey, save some money, you can have it here in our chapel or here in our hall or our reception area. Um, and so again, we're taking care of the decedent, but we may not necessarily be providing the service. So again, when you think of your competition, think much broader than just that low cost provider or that funeral home down the street. Chris, why don't you tell us a little bit about COVID recovery? Um, I think, John, you just you touched on it a few moments ago. Nobody, I certainly, I didn't think that we were going to be, you know, just on the, you know, just not even coming out of this COVID uh, pandemic at this point in time. You know, for those of you who have not had the opportunity to, to, uh, to look at our 2020 consumer behavior study, uh, it's a study that we conducted back in May. We released it in June. And at the time, we were looking at the pre-pandemic during the pandemic and post pandemic. So back in, in, in May and June, when we thought we were on the backside of this thing, uh, we were trying to get a perspective on um, how consumer behavior had changed. So if you haven't had a chance to look at that, I encourage you to go to the website, download, download the, the uh, handout, uh, or, or for that matter, go uh, click on the webinar and, uh, and experience and, and, and see some of the things that we had to say. But, the, the most interesting findings from that study are the funeral industry has changed from what, 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 it, what it was 12 months ago is a radically different world today. The consumer is looking for transparency. It's introduced an entirely new level of technology and the consumer is looking for convenience. You know, on transparency, 75% of consumers today are expecting have the access to pricing online. Now, 52% of all consumers are saying that if you don't offer that, 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 that those prices online, they're going to go to the guy down the street who is. So you know, in a world where you've got more than half of the consumers are saying that if you don't you know, play by our rules, uh, we're going to go somewhere else. I mean, that's a big shift. Technology, technology is permeating every facet of our business today. You know, I, generally, if you look at the funeral industry, which is by and large has probably been 20 years behind the times, uh, we've all been forced in the last eight months to adapt to this, to this virtual world. You know, what was a face-to-face -face world is now becoming a virtual world. Uh, the way that we plan for, the way that, we're, that, we, that we participate, and the way that we're involved in funerals has changed dramatically. 40% of all consumers today are telling us that they expect to be able to, to live stream a service. And most of those folks don't wanna pay for it. John, you just touched on one of the other pressures that we're feeling. 44% of all consumers do not think they have to spend a lot of money on a casket. It's almost half. They're not spending their money on the casket. A quarter of them are saying they don't even have to spend a lot on flowers. Now, the interesting thing is they're not telling us that they're gonna spend less but they wanna spend it in the ways that they want to. So ultimately, this is gonna affect the way that, you know, that, we, that, we, that we design our facilities, the way that our staff has changed or is trained. Uh, and it's a shift in our fixed costs and our incremental cost. It makes pricing that much more critical. Um, we just have to be a lot more flexible today. I mean, listen, we're all flexible in, in, in the life that we're living today. Um, I mean, heck, we're all virtual right now. And, and, and frankly, it, you know, this, this pressure that we're all feeling just means that we are going to have to be flexible and the cost to us is going to be, it's going to increase significantly. So if we don't take action, we're going to get left behind. And so if I understand correctly, Chris, what we're saying is uh, in addition to the cremation rates going up, um, profits are coming down, but costs are going up. So those two things are uh, sort of fighting one another, the, the profits and the uh, increased costs. So we've got to definitely find ways to replace that. Well, it, it, we have to find ways to replace it. And, you know, into the, to the, to the point that I made earlier is we have to be flexible. We have to make sure that we're pricing our goods and services properly. And, you know, more importantly, we have to listen to our consumer, listen to what the consumer is telling us they want, give them a double portion of that, 
listen to what they don't want and don't shove, don't push it upon. <clears throat> sure, sure, great. Well, the other area we want to talk about too is that unique selling proposition. That's what that was the third point that uh, I had shared with you on the three things about pet uh, cremations. And so, uh, with that unique selling proposition, um, you know, our job is to get beyond the noise. Again, as I said, oftentimes consumers reach out to us and they really can't tell one uh, one funeral home from another. Uh, and you know, when it comes to cremation or other things, oftentimes they believe every funeral home offers cremation. And if that's the case, every funeral home must own their own crematory. Um, so again, we've got to find ways to get beyond that noise and be able to stand out in the crowd. So I wanted to share with you a few interesting little statistics about that. And that is that 58% of consumers are not brand loyal. So what does that mean? The days of saying, hey, we've always served this family from one generation to the next is no longer the case. Um, consumers will easily switch to a different brand. Um, so we have to find ways to really solidify that loyalty among consumers to make sure that they don't move to the competitor down the street simply over a dollar or two. Um, also, the amount of time it takes to make first impressions um, that are formed about your brand is only 10 seconds. So that's why it's so important that, you know, your staff and yourself, everything is hitting on all cylinders. Because again, when that family walks in the door or contacts you or sees your ad or your website, you want to make sure that that first impression that they have is a really strong impression for your brand because they will um, make their impression of you within that 10 seconds. And once they've made that first impression, it will take you at least 30 minutes of dealing with that customer to change their perception if you need to change it in a different direction. So again, first impressions truly do count. And finally, that purchasing decisions are actually made subconsciously 90% of the time. And so what does that mean? You know, we all think that we're logical consumers and that we go in and we're, we've got all the facts and we're going to make the best, the best possible solution um, decision there is to make, but that's not really the case. Um, so what you want to do is it's important that we have top of mind awareness so that they're thinking about your brand, your company, um, what you have to offer. And so uh, again, 90% of the time, those decisions are made subconsciously. So if the subconscious mind is going to make the decision, you want to make sure that the decision is you. And so we're going to share some ways that uh, pet cremations can do that for you and your company. But let's first talk about rules for attracting new customers to the service industry. Um, and there's really three rules that apply here um, and they tie in nicely together uh, with pet loss. But the three rules for attracting them to a new service industry are the following. Top of mind awareness, as I mentioned, trust and building relationships. So again, top of mind awareness, you want to make sure that when they, they have a death and they have to call a funeral home, that yours is the funeral home that they think of. Um, trust is paramount. Again, nobody buys from someone that they don't trust. So we have a very short period of time often in the funeral business to build that trust, to break down those walls. And so again, uh, that's why we need to work so diligently to build trust. And relationships, again, most people want to do business with somebody they know, somebody that they have a relationship with. And so again, you'll see through the pet business how you can build those relationships to solidify that loyalty that I talked about earlier that is diminishing within the funeral industry. You know, death is an infrequent purchase, and that's whether it's a pet or a person, but definitely with a person. You know, they say typically you only intimately are involved in a death 
twice in a lifetime. So those are pretty far apart there, hopefully um, on the spectrum. But uh, because of that, over the years, I've heard many people say, including myself, that uh, if we want to offer better service to our customers and create a better customer experience, that we need to look to other service industries that do such a great job. Uh, again, whether that's the Ritz-Carlton Hotel, whether that's the fine restaurant in your town, or whether it's Disney World. Oftentimes we think of the Disney Institute and other places where we can learn to deliver exceptional customer service. And although that is true that we should look to those industries, the problem with that though is oftentimes we get misguided. Um, these are great for giving us ideas on how to have our staff, you know, dress and appear, or how to make our facilities look nicer, you know, other things like that. But we are in an industry, in all honesty, that nobody wants to buy. Who wakes up in the morning and says, guess what? I want to go down to the funeral home and buy a funeral. That doesn't usually happen. So we really need to also look to other industries that are also ones that people typically don't want to buy. And that would be things like your plumber, your AC repairman, your auto mechanic. Again, nobody wants to have to call this plumber on Sunday because the drains won't drain in your house or the AC repairman because you have no air conditioning in the midst of summertime much less take your car in to get a new transmission put in. But when you do, you want to make sure that you take them to the right one. You want to make sure that you find one that you are going to trust, that you have a relationship with. And so again, many times we can find great ways to market our business if we look at some of these other industries that are out there that consumers oftentimes frequent more than a funeral home or more than a pet provider. So again, these are three rules for attracting new customers. So if you are going to market your funeral home and cemetery, um, you know, let's look at the top of mind awareness campaign. How do we do top of mind awareness campaigns? What gets you top of mind? Well, that comes through things like community events and public relation activities. Those would be your holiday programs that you're putting on. I just saw one the other day on, on Facebook. One of our colleagues out there in the industry is getting ready to do their holiday event. Um, so again, those are great community relations, top of mind awareness. Same with your grief seminars, you know, when you bring in Dr. Wolfelt or others to your community, as well as your aftercare support groups, all of those help to build your top of mind awareness as do those community awareness advertisements, you know, the don't drink and drive, don't text and drive, we can wait, all those different campaigns that we've seen out there in the funeral industry. The other side of that part two was to become that trusted partner in the community. So how do you do that? How do you promote your funeral home to do that? Well, we do that through community importance, you know, our staff involvement in the community, many times on Facebook or other social media or in the newspapers, you know, we'll promote the fact that, hey, our staff's involved in this or that in the community and giving back to the community. Same with the years of service to your community. We've been serving St. Petersburg for, you know, 100 years or whatever the case may be. And also through community support. That would be things like participating with charitable organizations or sponsoring youth activities or other things. All those are done to build that trust on the consumer's mind to make you a trusted partner. Uh, but really your goal when it comes to advertising or getting a name and top of mind awareness out there, it should be through, your goal should be to get free publicity and third party testimonies, um, you know, because why? Because they're viewed as being more powerful than paid advertising, uh, but yet they're much harder to obtain. So again, your Google reviews online are so important because again, those are third party testimonies. Um, you or I, as funeral professionals can talk to we're blue in the face to the consumer but oftentimes what happens is if the if there's a third party saying what a great job you do that bring holds much more water for the customer um, than you or i saying it so but we have some great news for you and that's that pets can do all of those for you and pet cremation can do all of that for you so 
Let's jump in here with a couple of examples. Here's an example of some free publicity since that's part of our goal. Um, this here was our funeral home. When uh, we started the pet business, we put in the little room you see to the right there. That was our rainbow bridge room. It was a pet friendly goodbye room where families could come in and see their pet one last time before we did the cremation. And we made it pet friendly where if there's other pets in the family, they can bring those pets in too. That was inside our funeral home. And because of that, with families coming in to do that. The St. Petersburg Times or Tampa Bay Times ran a full page front page article about our funeral business and what was happening. Uh, those are things that, you know, money just can't buy that kind of public relations out um, advertising. So again, newspapers and other news media, though, they love to the heartwarming side of the business. And so pets oftentimes will do that for you. Here are two other examples. These are examples of third party testimonies. Um, and I took these right off of Yelp, um, five star reviews. And these are the pictures that the families actually posted out there and the comments they had to say about pets. And so again, the amazing thing that I find here is oftentimes the pet families would send us long letters um, or post big uh, um, testimonials out there on websites for us much more than our human families did. But again, it still builds trust. And the best part for me as a funeral homeowner back then was that they forget about the pet passage name that we had for our pet division. Instead, they talk about Anderson McQueen as far as the funeral home name. So again, it's building name awareness for the funeral home. So how can pet loss marketing do this for you? Well, again, as I mentioned earlier, although we like to think we buy logically, people actually buy based on emotion and then they back it up with logic. At least that's what Simon Sinek says in addition to myself. So uh, I guess you can believe it since Simon is saying it. But, um, but what pet loss does is it allows you to touch more families more often. Um, so again, as Dan alluded to early in the warm up here, was that uh, you know many times pet families have not only multiple pets, oftentimes at the same time, but they'll have a multitude of pets throughout a lifetime. So what does that mean? Well, they're also going to have more pet deaths. So the deaths are going to occur more frequently than those two or so uh, human deaths that you'll be intimately involved in. So it allows you to touch the families more often and build those relationships that are so necessary. It also allows you to touch younger families. And this is important because oftentimes younger families don't want to talk about pre-need. However, many times they're the decision makers or at least influencers with their parents or grandparents about their future funeral arrangements. Um, and ultimately, they'll be your future customers. So again, if you can build that relationship with them earlier on, you'll be able to build a relationship for a lifetime. The two last ones are that you can touch families outside your market. Um, you can extend that reach. You know, inconvenience becomes irrelevant. And so, for example, we had uh, in my county, we had a family come to us. Oftentimes we had six to eight families a month that would come in into the funeral home and say they chose us because we cremated their pets. But we had one one time that came from north of Pinellas County um, to our funeral home in South Pinellas. County. That route made them cross about 45 other funeral homes between where they lived and where they got to us. And the sole reason they came to us for their loved one's death was because we had cremated their pet before. So again, it allowed us to reach much farther than we would normally reach with the funeral home. And finally, uh, the fourth one is that touch families of competitors. Um, so again, uh, actually, we've had numerous families that have come to us that were had always used the other funeral home down the street or one of those other funeral homes down the street. But they were now coming to us because we had handled their pet. 
So, you know, when you're trying to acquire new customers, um, the pro they say that customer acquisition, the probabilities of selling to a new customer um, is about five to 20%. So you have somewhere in that five to 20% range of securing that new customer. But selling to an existing customer, you have a 60 to 70% chance that you're going to sell to the existing customer. So if you can build this relationship with pets, you should be able to have a much greater chance converting those pet families to people families. Also, they say that a 2% increase in the retention of a customer is comparable to a 10% reduction in cost. So again, by building those relationships with pet families and being able to keep them, if you can just increase 2%, you can cut your costs by 10%. So that is a huge savings to the funeral home. And again, going back to the emotion side of things, oftentimes what we heard was, wow, if you do all that for a pet, what would you do for my mom? And so again, as I said, many times we were converting families over from the pet side to the people side. And if you want to learn more about a lot of this, here's a great book you can read on that that will help to solidify some of this for you. John, it sounds like a lot of this is about building and establishing relationships and, and almost stickiness with the consumer. But um, I mean, let's talk about the economics. Is there any money to be made in serving pets? I mean, do you serve many differently? What, what's, what's this look like from a business standpoint? Sure, Chris, I'm glad you brought that up because that's an important aspect. You know, what I'd like to first illustrate for you though is it's really about the lifetime value of a customer because what we really want to do, we don't want to just secure that one time hit with one customer. We want to find a way to secure a lifetime of customers. So let's just use the following illustration. If you had a new pet customer, age 48, his, his or her life expectancy is about 30 years. Um, so based on that, we could anticipate that we would have the following funerals during that anticipated life expectancy. As a conservative estimate, you will probably get their parents. So uh, that might give you two funerals there, the parents of the pet owner. Um, you may also pick up the pet owner's spouse's parents, which would give you two more, plus the pet owner's spouse and the pet owner. So right there, there's a potential for six funerals there alone. Plus, as we talked about before, many pet owners own multiple pets at one point in time, at, at the same time. In fact, they say on average, you have 1.6 dogs per household and 1.8 cats per household. Um, so conservatively speaking, you'll have probably four more pet losses at least during that 30 year period. So as I like to say, one can equal six. So you end up with six future funerals using, and if we use the average NFDA 2020 funeral cost of 63.95, um, what does that mean? Well, the lifetime value of that customer in today's dollars is $38,370. Um, and so, you know, how can we extrapolate that? Well, if you're bringing in on average about six customers um, a month that are pet customers, you know, in a year's time, that's over a million eight in future value of lifetime customers moving forward. So the potential there is tremendous for your business. And in fact, um, if you look at those at need funerals, as I said, those converted families, we chose you because you cremated our pets. Again, um, if you only did four actually over a 12 month period, that's 48 converted pet families um, into people families, which again would equate out to a million eight. Uh, and I know you're probably thinking, well, that's great that you all did that. And I know you did a lot of pets, so uh, that may have worked for you. But what about me? What if I don't do that many pet cases? Well, even if you're a smaller pet provider, what if you only do one per month for a year? That would still equate out to nearly a half a million dollars. So again, the lifetime value of a potential pet customer is tremendous to your business. Um, 
But as Chris asked, hey, can I really make money at pet loss? Well, again, this was from 2006 when I still owned the funeral home, but annual pet deaths that year were 2,765 pet deaths that we handled at an average pet death of $77.40. That's between our wholesale rates and our retail rates. So that came out to about $214,000 in revenue, uh, deduct out the expenses, and we had net income of a little over $100,000 in additional net income. Now, if you add in the cases um, from the funeral home side that we were securing on a monthly basis, we averaged about five cases a month. So you're looking at about 60 new cases a year between at need and pre need and our average values for the funeral home there uh, between at need and pre need. So again, uh, uh, this was a tremendous, a tremendous boost in sales for the funeral home. Uh, Chris, you could probably talk a little bit more on the global side, though. Yeah, John, I mean, obviously, it looks like, you know, on, on a local or a, uh, an independent level, you've talked a little bit about the economics um, of the pet business. And I think the interesting thing that I take from that is that it's you're not serving necessarily just the pets, you're serving the family. Um, but if, as many people may have seen in the funeral director daily about a month ago, uh, InvoCare, which is the largest funeral provider in Australia, New Zealand, and Singapore, just made a, a, a big splash in the Australian market with the pet business. They entered the business in 2018, um, but just uh, a little over a month ago, they made two acquisitions for a total of uh, 66,000 cremations these two businesses were doing. Um, they actually had uh, about $14 million of revenue. I believe there was about $3.8 million of EBITDA. And uh, they ended up paying a nine and a half times multiple for that. So they paid, I believe it was $36 million for all those businesses. And um, so make no, make, make no mistake about it. You know, these are real serious businesses. And when you look at the acquisition market, we were talking about this last week, but uh, a nine and a half times multiple uh, on a funeral business is a very, very big number. Um, you know, and one of the things that I can only attribute uh, why anybody be willing to pay that kind of money for a business like this is for precisely what you just described, John. It's, I mean, ultimately you're going to serve these families, these 66,000 families but I would have to believe that if somebody's willing to pay almost 10 times cash flow, John, it's got to be because of what the lifetime value of those consumers really is. Sure. I mean, obviously, if, if we were buying a business today, you definitely want to look at what your future holds for you. And knowing you have that in your pipeline definitely would, would help to add to the, the value, I would, I would assume. So. Yeah, I mean, one of the things, John, that you mentioned earlier, and I don't want it to be lost because I was talking with uh, a couple last week and they were talking about how they couldn't break the barrier of certain towns and that they were locked into their little markets. And maybe just real quickly, John, just, just point out again how the pet business broadened your marketplace and how you went from what were your more traditional, uh, let's call it geographic boundaries to, um, you know, to really expanding through Pinellas County and, and beyond, and then ultimately serving those families, uh, you know, in the future. Sure, Chris, be happy to. So again, you know, uh, pet family, the, the one of the great things about pet families is that pet families, unlike other marketing opportunities that you have out there, pet families are actually paying you to convert them into future funeral families, which is a wonderful thing. So uh, why don't we all love to have people paying us to actually secure them as future clients. Also, the net cost to you is zero dollars. So sure, you're going to have some upfront costs to get up and running like in any business, but uh, ultimately um, you will get that paid off and you'll, uh, you'll have zero cost to you going forward with marketing to other families. Um, also, 
also you can make money while you're acquiring new customers, which is a great thing. So as I showed you back from uh, earlier, back from when uh, I was still owning the funeral home uh, on an annual basis, it was net revenues to us of a little over $100,000 in pet business, uh, which was a great thing. And uh, yet it gave us the opportunity to touch another 20, almost 2,800 families annually to introduce them to our brand. You know, we integrated it into our our funeral home so that it was actually a part of the funeral home so they actually got to experience what funeral families would get to experience um, to help solidify that relationship and that touch factor that we talked about um, as well as the goodwill that you get out of serving those pet families is priceless one of the things that's great about pet families is the fact that pet families are huge advocates um, for your business. So whereas human families oftentimes may tell somebody that you did a great job, pet families, my experience at least has been, if you do a great job for the pet family, they are an active advocate out in the marketplace telling people to go to you know, your funeral home, your pet business uh, because of what a wonderful job you did. And in doing so, that really helped us, Chris, to be able to grow our funeral business even larger um, so that by the time we did decide to exit the, exit the funeral world as funeral home owners, we were able to be the largest family-owned funeral home in Florida. So, uh, and I attribute a lot of that to the pet business. John, let me ask you one quick question. So the, in, in hearing all of the benefits to this, do I think about this as, as am, I, am I serving the families because of the pets? Is this to make money simply on the, on the pet business? Or is this part of a bigger, broader, just funeral strategy, growth strategy? And um, it seems like there it, there's, there, there's positives to just about every facet of this business. You're correct. Um, there are, and actually I would say it's all three of those. So, you know, um, from the, the heart side of the business, you're helping the families and you have to definitely, you don't have to necessarily be a pet owner. I get asked this a lot by funeral directors. You don't have to be a pet owner to get into the pet business but you do have to get into it for the right motive, not just the dollars. You want to get into it because you want to serve your community and you want to find a way to reach out and touch more families in your community that will ultimately help grow your funeral brand. At that same point in time, though, it, it's not just a, a marketing campaign of throwing money out the door to try to hopefully get another one or two death calls here or there. It's actually a way of building your business, um, um, that is actually going to let you reap some benefits immediately from a cash flow standpoint. Uh, but again, it will definitely help to grow your business, grow your market share. And it's something that uh, um, the community oftentimes gets behind, your, your uh, news outlets like to get behind, and even your employees like to get behind. Um, so it's really a win-win-win a um, because I think it's that fact that my wife's not always happy to see me when I get home, but my pet was always happy to see me when I get home. So it's that, you know, forever love that you get from your pet. And it's that tugging at the heart that uh, makes it all worthwhile. So John and Chris, thank you very much for your uh, comments. We do have a few questions that have come in. So uh, uh, before I, I introduce the first question to you, I do want to remind our listeners that uh, they will get a survey when this is over. They will get a copy of the handout, a link to the video so they could share that with their staff and friends. John, one of the questions that, that I got is that, is this a service that works in all markets, meaning urban, suburban, and rural, or is it mainly one that works in urban and suburban markets? Sure, that's a great question. Um, so I would say primarily it's it's urban and suburban. Um, you know, more than than the rural side probably because you know if you're truly in a rural community. If Fluffy passes away, we're probably going to bury him out on the back 40 somewhere. Uh, but uh, then again, on the other side, if if your horse Trigger passes away 
going to have to be a pretty big hole that you're going to have to dig out back. So, uh, um, you know, obviously maybe if you're in the rural area, you want to make sure you have an option for serving the, the horse side of the business. Um, but definitely in your, in your urban and your suburban areas, um, pet loss and pet services are a huge winner for you. Chris, a question came in about uh, the, the money chasing the ownership of these businesses. Are we seeing people uh, and investors that want to come into the pet side of the world? No question. Um, I think you, you know, we highlighted the, the one example in, um, in Australia that just took place. But I've also, you know, we've heard quite a, quite a bit of rumbling about certain private equity, private money that has been chasing that, particularly up in the northeastern U.S., uh, along the East Coast. So, yeah, there, it's, there's a lot of uh, appeal to this business. And I think John's highlighted uh, a number of the different reasons why. Uh, so not only is there a bunch of money to be made in serving the families of, of, of pet owners, but it also opens the door to the bigger, broader relationship and the touch point and building relationships with the consumers. John, Tony asked the question, uh, uh, is there price sensitivity in the pet business as we see in the differentiation between providers on the human business? There's not as much price sensitivity. Uh, for one reason, you have a lot less um, pet providers, um, especially localized pet providers. Many of the veterinarian clinics, um, again, I will tell you, vets are a lot like uh, hospice of the funeral service world. Um, they're sort of that gatekeeper of the death care. So uh, uh, most veterinarians use, like in my area, there's about two or three providers that really service most most of the vets and their, their far off providers located in different parts of the state. And they make a, what's called a milk run type philosophy where they circle to circle around once a week and pick up all the pets. Whereas if you're providing it in your marketplace, you can provide much more personalized attentive service um, and you're able to pick up a lot of those vets. So uh, again, to the consumer directly, no, there's not a lot of price sensitivity. To the veterinarian, you are going to have to be able to sort of compete against those other providers though out there in the marketplace. So that's why we have wholesale pricing and retail pricing um, because again, we our wholesale side for the vet has to compete against some of those other providers. Um, but uh, to the retail side of the business, the consumer direct to the customer, uh, price sensitivity is not as great. Let me ask this question to Chris first and John second. And, and I almost wish that our colleague Curtis Rostad uh, was broadcasting with us for this question. Albert asked the question, are you aware of any options for pet families to pre-fund for their pet burial or cremation, either insurance or trust? Uh, I remember, uh, if, if I remember correctly, Curtis, uh, created one of the first pre-need products uh, for the Indiana Funeral Directors Association. Chris, are you seeing anything on the financial world having this product? I have not seen it on the pre-planning side for uh, the cremation services, but it's funny you say that because yesterday I did get a, uh, a solicitation to provide pet health insurance to all of our employees. Um, incidentally, but not, I haven't seen it on the uh, pre-planning side, but uh, John, you, you might have a little more insight there. Sure. Um, we actually did do some pet pre-planning um, at our funeral home. Now, again, I will tell you, you'll need to check your individual state laws and things, um, but in Florida, at least, there's no requirement that those funds be trusted or put into a pre-need type policy. So what we did was we came up with a cremation certificate um, type program where we would give the family this um, certificate showing that they had prepaid one pet cremation. We usually put the pet's name on it and the weight of the pet. Um, and, uh, you know, the family would go ahead and prepay it to us. Um, and since there's no trusting requirements or things in Florida for pet 
prepayment. Um, that actually goes direct into your operating account. So, but we we did maintain records of that, just like we would a pre need on anybody else, so that ultimately when the pet death did occur, we would know that we could fulfill it. And the reason that we put the weight of the pet on there is because one of the things that you will experience oftentimes if you get into doing that for customers is that you know, they may have a different pet in their family die first. And so uh, they may come to you with that pet. And what you don't want to do is have them prepay for a, a 10 pound dog and they bring you the 140 pound Great Dane, you know, so uh, um, different price point there. But uh, yes, some families do it. It wasn't a huge part of our business, but we did have some families do it. Chris, I'm, I'm curious when somebody wants to sell their human business, are they going to sell their pet business at the same time? Or might they bifurcate them and sell one now and the other at a different time? I think more often than not, for all of the reasons that John highlighted, we see them being sold uh, at the same time um, because they, they're so uh, interchangeable in the way that they feed off of each other. Um, but I guess there's, there's no real, uh, I would say rule of thumb that says you couldn't uh, sell one and keep the other. Uh, but again, ultimately, I guess it's the beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. And if the, you know, the buyer, I would assume would be drawn to both businesses for all of the, the best parts that John's highlighted here. Uh, but we've, I guess we've actually been involved in a, in quite a few of those transactions in the past few years and they've gone, uh, they've, they've, they've sold them both together. Uh, John, a uh, question from, from David. If your goal is to introduce your brand to a younger market, how does the non-pet market perceive uh, both the pet and human business under the same name or brand? Sure. Uh, we had, uh, at least my experience has been, we've had no negative impact on our human business. Uh, by offering pets. And that seems to be standard among all my colleague friends that have pet businesses out there with their funeral homes. Uh, but that being said, you do have to have certain what I call non-negotiables that you put forth. So for example, we do not put pets in we don't cross over. So in other words, uh, we're not going to come to the house with a hearse to pick up your dog. Uh, we're not going to use our human transfer vehicle to make the pet transfers. Uh, so again, we're not going to cross back and forth like that. Also, uh, at least in Florida, the only requirement that they have uh, as far as like pet retorts is just that the pet retort cannot be located inside the same crematory as a human retort. Um, so they do have to be in two separate buildings or at least divided by solid wall, things like that. But again, one of the things that we did was we went with a little bit smaller pet unit so that um, families could definitely tell the difference between a human retort and a pet retort because we didn't want them to get the feeling like as though, hey, we might be switching back and forth. But you definitely want to, you know, segregate from that aspect. But other than that, no families had had anything negative um, in regards to us serving pet families too. This is not a question, but Paul Williams from uh, uh, Congressional Cemetery in Washington, D.C., who is one of the most creative innovators in, in the uh, cemetery side, uh, doesn't ask a question, but makes a statement that Congressional Cemetery in D.C., which Paul supervises, uh, now does pet pre-planning with individual pet sites. Uh, as well as a pet ossuary uh, as, as a low price option. One thing that we haven't talked about on this is the cemetery side of the pet business. And our clients who have had parts of their cemetery grounds dedicated for pet use, uh, I would dare say on a square inch for square inch basis, it is the most profitable part of their cemetery. Chris, have you had experience with that? Well, I can tell you that in uh, 
at my home growing up, we had our own little pet cemetery and my mother would get little uh, monuments made for each of the pets when they passed away. But I think you point out a, 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 a very good point, Dan, uh, that it is a much more common thing nowadays that people are setting aside parts of the cemeteries, again, because of how uh, commingled we are with our animals and they're parts of our family and people, um, you know, and they, and they look to memorialize them. <clears throat> John, you had a boutique cemetery as part of your funeral empire when you owned it. Uh, did you ever consider uh, having pet uh, in interment or inurnment? We talked about it. Um, as you mentioned, Dan, being that boutique cemetery, we were kind of, uh, space was at a premium. So we did not end up using any of that for pets per se. Uh, we did have a good colleague, friend of mine uh, up the street, uh, had a uh, pet section in his cemetery and it's been very successful for them from what I understand. And in fact, when we had families that wanted, did not want pet cremation but wanted pet burial we would actually refer them to his pet cemetery um, and he did not do pet cremation so if he had a family that, that, that wanted pet cremation that even was going to end up in his cemetery he would refer them back to us so it was a very harmonious relationship there and uh, again you know from what I've seen in their cemetery it, it's a, a wonderful thing um, and I know a lot of other funeral homes out there do have them I really focused on the cremation side, just so you know, because of the fact that, you know, as more and more families are choosing cremation for their loved ones, um, typically they seem to choose that same disposition for their pet. And so uh, um, that's why we sort of focused in on the cremation side. When you're handling 80% human cremation, you figure 80% of them are going to probably be pet cremation too, you know, so. And John or, or Chris, uh, Stephen wants to know, who are the manufacturers of pet retorts? Uh, what do they cost? Uh, is there any uh, zoning issues in the installation? Sure. Um, Chris, if you want, I can jump in on that some. Um, so most all your manufacturers now do offer pet uh, retorts. Again, uh, our retort came from B&L Cremation Systems um, in Largo. Um, they did our human ones also, but uh, Matthews uh, has a big pet division on their pet retorts. Um, I think American Crematories does. So pretty much all of them do. Um, they now also have uh, units that are specifically designed that have uh, um, sort of more like a traditional human retort, the one big door at one end that they can do. So you can do communal cremains, but then often they have smaller ones built into the side of the unit. So you can do individual cremations in its own separate uh, um, little chamber and things. So I would just encourage you to reach out to some of the major suppliers as far as that's concerned. It's been a few years since I put one in myself, but uh, um, the pet retort was uh, probably at the time that we put it in, ours was a little smaller than a human one, was probably about 75% the cost of a human retort. So uh, I would say probably somewhere in the $75,000 range nowadays, if I was estimating out a cost for you. Um, so I I think that answered your question. I don't remember all the parts to it, Dan, but I'm pretty sure that answered most of it. And, and for our attendees, all of your questions, I'm gonna make sure uh, that they are memorialized with a short uh, email response as part of the follow-up. In the event you wanna have further uh, questions answered, uh, we can arrange for that as well. Albert asks a uh, follow-up a question for John. Did you have any formal program introducing your pet business uh, when meeting with humans or, or pre-needs? We, well, we did um, from the aspect of, uh, obviously we had a lot of press out there in the community, rolled it out. So it was pretty well known in the community that we were offering it. Um, but uh, uh, there's quite a few ways that you can continue to promote it. We tied it back to the funeral home. So ours was called Pet Passages by Anderson McQueen. We always wanted to have that funeral home name in there. Uh, but uh, even in what we called our resource guide that we gave out to every family, 
It was, uh, con it's like our general price list, but it contained a lot more information. Even right in there, we had a whole page dedicated to pet cremation and the pricing for pet cremation and everything. So we made it a uh, full and visible, I guess, using the terms that Chris did earlier, we were very transparent about it. Um, so we wanted people to know we handled pets and uh, we wanted to know what it cost and everything that went along with it. So. John, you also did one other thing. Maybe you could talk about it. Uh, you were uh, and had wrapped, a, was it a smart car or something with a beautiful uh, decoration uh, that you would use to drive around the community? Sure. So for our pet transfer van um, that went to all the veterinary clinics, it went to on all the home removals. If we had to pick a pet up at home, uh, we actually use a Ford Transit van, uh, one of those small old Ford Transit minivan type things. And uh, so my wife and I took it to a local uh, uh, company that could wrap vehicles. And so it was wrapped sort of with what we had on our website, but it had all sorts of pets and things on there. It was a very uh, um, eye-catching uh, design and it had, you know, obviously pet passages by Anderson McQueen and that that was pet cremations and what we did and our contact information. And uh, it was well received by everybody. It was a really neat looking vehicle, but even more importantly, it became our moving billboard. So it was always running around town. So not only was it promoting pets, uh, but it was also promoting uh, Anderson McQueen at the same time. So it was definitely that moving billboard for us and uh, got us a lot of, of recognition. And, and consistent with uh, something which uh, Paul wanted uh, to make sure that our, our attendees understood, uh, the phrase fairy friends is really limiting uh, because many of the cremations will be pets uh, or other uh, animals. That's very true. We, uh, in fact, actually, after we got into it, 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 you have to be nimble in the pet business, especially in the beginning. Um, so we learned that uh, a lot of our pet families actually have pets that are less than a pound. Um, so we actually came out with what we called pocket pals. And those consisted of things like gerbils and parakeets and snakes and all kinds of other things so whatever you kept at home um that's your your favorite beloved companion at home we serviced on the other end um and so again uh, you'll get them with scales and and tails i guess you could say and and you know about the pet crematory they got the phone call wanting to know if they would cremate someone's pet sheep and the response was nah Dan is really going for winning out on those puns and things today. So I, I'm trying to win the bet. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I appreciate you taking the time to be with us for this. As we've said, this is part of a seminar series with Insight that Foresight is going to be continuing. If you have ideas for other topics you'd like us to cover, please let us know that. You will be getting a questionnaire, short questionnaire. We do want your comments so that way we can make this the best experience possible. If you have other questions after the fact, send them to us. We will give you those personalized answers. We do have some uh, services that, that we do offer in, in a package for those that are looking to get into this. And please feel free to use us for that. I do want to thank John and Chris uh, for their time. I do also want to thank Nicole Vulo, our marketing manager, uh, for her help in coordinating this. Uh, once again, Nicole will be sending you a follow-up with a copy of the slides, a link to the video. Chris did mention the 2020 survey that we did on consumer uh, attitudes dealing with what people want to see the funeral business do post pandemic. And we will send you a link to that webinar. And on our website, there are two white papers. And within the next few days, there will be a third white paper helping you understand how to win post pandemic. So on behalf of Foresight, Chris, John, Nicole, and myself, please feel free to like us on LinkedIn, Facebook, Thank you very much for attending, and I hope that we exceeded 
your expectations. Good Thank night. you, everyone. Thank you.